uh, elevate the uh, voices of leaders in the OER movement and also showcase the great work that's having, happening in states all throughout the United States. And in the past uh, 10 years that we've been working with OER, we've encountered a lot of really wonderful leaders that are super inspiring and that have really taken the time to uh, research and understand what the needs are and priorities of their states and and rolled out some really uh, great initiatives uh, that we think would help uh, inform other states that are thinking about doing the same thing. So that was really the intention of, of this storytelling series was to invite these different leaders in and, and share their stories of how they began with OER and what they've learned along the way and their current status of their OER initiatives and their states and even some of their plans for the future. So um, it's been really fun doing this series and uh, we had, we've had received such great feedback on it that we'll be hopefully offering more storytelling series uh, over, over the, the next few months. And um, yeah, so we have Erica Zimmer with us here today and she is a uh, technology integration specialist in, in Vermont. And she has a lot of expertise in many different areas of education, which is great because she brings those all into her work, uh, not only supporting districts, but also the, the state of Vermont. Um, and that's instructional design, uh, obviously technology integration. Uh, she's a teacher coach. She um, also um, has a background in uh, ELL teaching, English language learners. So um, she brings all of this great expertise to her work in Vermont. And when I first uh, saw Erica uh, doing her, her work, I, she was sharing um, some of the courses that she's been creating to support um, educators in Vermont virtually to really get up to speed on what OER is and how they can really shift their teaching practice with, with open educational resources and uh, when I first spoke with her about this course, I thought it was so great what she was doing and I wanted to just learn more about what she was doing. And she was sharing with me that she's always kind of graduate or gravitated towards OER without even really knowing it was OER, which I thought was interesting. And then once she found out about uh, the open educational resource movement, she's uh, really taken it on and, and has thought really deeply around how it can support some of the really interesting uh, changes and innovations that they're trying to to roll out in in Vermont and um, it's definitely a, a time of change in, in the state of Vermont which you'll hear from her and there it's a really exciting time for OER to to really support some of their their priorities and goals for the next few years um, another thing I thought was really interesting about when I was uh, first speaking with Erica was just um, about the culture that they're really trying to create in terms of innovation and experimentation in education. And you don't always see, especially at the district and state level, people really encourage people to try and fail and, and experiment um, with, with different resources and, and, and technology. And um, there's, they have a certain expectation at their school that really how they, do the, this work is up to them and their school uh, as long as they, um, you know, accomplish some of their goals. And so they're moving forward at a pace that, that works for them throughout the state. And um, Erica has been, been supporting uh, folks throughout. So it's a really interesting time to, to speak with her and learn about what, what they're hoping to do in Vermont and what she's learned so far. And so I just want to, uh, thank Erica so much for, for being a part of this storytelling series and welcome her to share her story. And then we'll, uh, she'll have maybe take around 15 or 20 minutes to, to share uh, her OER journey. And then we'll have time for questions and discussion afterwards. And since we're a nice small group, um, we can feel our mics are muted now, but uh, we can turn the mics off and actually you know, talk to each other or you're welcome to use chat as well, whatever you feel most comfortable with. But I'll be um, monitoring the chat throughout. So if you have different questions or comments that you want to share in chat, 
feel free and I'll, I'll uh, be sure to point those out to Erica once she's done. So thanks again, everyone for joining us and welcome Erica. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, loud and clear. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, yes, my name is Erica Zimmer, and I live in Vermont. And it's a beautiful spring day right now. We had a really long um, winter, so it's it's nice to finally see the sunshine. Um, but just to expand a little bit about my personal story with uh, Open Education Resources, I've been teaching since let's see, um, two thousand and. Um, and when I started teaching, I seemed to always get myself um, into schools that were quite under budgeted and um, underfunded. And um, my, my early years, I would uh, be at a school and they'd be like, here's your classroom. Here's what you got. You have no budget, so don't buy anything. <laughs> and I was like, OK, like, what do I do now? Um, and I just kind of uh, realized if I had uh, an internet connection and a computer, I could, I could open up a whole other world to my students. And so I just started gravitating in that direction. And, um, and, and technology's been pretty natural to me. Um, my, my bachelor's degree is actually in computer information systems and I sort of fell into teaching after um, undergraduate school. Um, so I was just, you know, scour the internet for whatever I could find. Um, and at that time, and there was, there was some stuff, it was pretty limited, um, but I, I would try my best and I noticed my students would be more interested if we were, if we were looking at and connecting to things online. Um, and that was before we had one-to-one -one or even, I think we had one school, I had one computer lab, but it was barely used and I was using it all the time. So much so that the, um, the IT guy at my school set up a mini lab in my classroom so I would have kids blogging and they would be finding stuff and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and I didn't know, I had never heard the term OER until a couple of years ago. Um, I had been working out of country and then I moved back and um, I got this job about, um, this is about three years ago, four years ago. Um, and then, um, so I started working in this position and really taking off with, I was quite um, amazed at, I was out of the country for a couple of years only and coming back and it was just like this technology explosion in schools. And I was really amazed and really interested in it. And I, I um, somehow got this really fun position as a technology integration specialist. I was previously um, mostly teaching um, English language learners. I also taught Spanish um, and really got this fun job as a technology integration specialist. And um, I do a lot of great things. I mostly am a teacher coach, so I help teachers integrate technology into their curriculum. Um, again, we're not wealthy schools. We're, I'm in rural Vermont, so mm -hmm. our population, student populations are quite small. Um, one of my schools that I go to is a, is a pre-K to 12, all in the same building, so it's teeny. Um, so we have limited resources and limited funding again. Um, and I have been lucky to be part of, as soon as um, the Go Open initiative was announced by the U.S. Department of Education, um, the Vermont Agency of Education jumped right on it and um, formed an ambassador group. And I was lucky to be part of that ambassador, ambassador group. Um, and, you know, from the get-go, our, our hurdle was, you know, how do we, how do we spread this? How do we get people interested in open education resources. Um, so we first um, decided that we needed to find a platform that we could um, use and to support educators in using. And that's where, um, that's where OER Commons came into play. And I was lucky enough to be on sort of the committee that, that um, was able to help select OER Commons, and it was by far, um, I think, a really great decision that we've made so far. 
um, Vermont is um, going through some pretty interesting changes. And I think open education resources are really going to help catapult us in the right direction. Um, Vermont passed a law a couple years ago that requires, it's called Act 77, and there's three major components to this law. Um, we do proficiency-based grading. So the main component is we no longer do A's and B's and 100s and 80s and all that stuff, because what does that really mean? And what does that tell us? We do proficiency. Have they met the proficiency or have they not met the proficiency? Is that pretty much black and white? Um, and the other component is we, every student from grade seven and up, um, makes a personalized learning plan. So they, it's a plan that describes who they are as a learner, they, um, what their interests are, um, what they want to learn about, they set goals, things like that. And then the third component is based on sort of their personalized learning plan. Um, we're supposed to offer our students flexible pathways for learning. So we're supposed to be offering our students multiple ways to learn the same proficiency, which is a huge undertaking and a really big task for teachers to um, figure out how to do because um, it's a lot. It's a lot of work on front loading that. Um, an example classroom would be um, there's a science teacher I work with and he sets up his classroom in this sort of learning menu style. So um, students, when you walk into the classroom, students are in different places of their learning path. So he has these units and there are points in the units where you you know, have to meet at a certain time, but the students navigate through the units at their own pace and he has all these resources for different types of learning and stuff like that. And that's where I think the power of OERs is, is helping teachers provide all of these different pathways for learning without having to reinvent it themselves. Um, and, I, and I feel like another really powerful component of open education resources is um, we also encourage a part of the flexible pathways is allowing the student to um, negotiate in a way how they want to learn that proficiency. Um, so they could essentially, if a student's really struggling in one indicator on a proficiency, um, you know, they could go to an open education resource themselves and choose the resource that they want to use to learn that proficiency. Um, and I think that can be really powerful as well as allowing this kids to have a little bit more ownership in their education and deciding how they learn the material. Um, you know, Vermont's tricky. We are a pretty, I'd say in, in education, a pretty progressive state. Um, and they, they give us this law, but then they don't really give us much guideline and many guidelines around how to, how to, um, sort of tick the boxes for this law. They're kind of like, you, you do what you need to do. And that's how Vermont operates. We have a lot of local control. So each school, even within my, um, we call it a supervisory union. So it's made up of little school districts, even within our supervisory union and even within the district. The schools do it a different way. Um, so that's really um, interesting to see. It's also challenging to kind of figure out, well, what are, what are we supposed to do and how are we supposed to do this correctly? So um, I think OERs offer, offers that flexibility and that, um, you know, that ability to still choose how you approach this and how you want to do it. And um, without spending a fortune on um, programs and, and things like that. And we want to move away from um, expensive curriculum and try to try to free up these funds um, for professional development. And we're in my district, we're really focusing on um, focused professional development and tying it into what we do. Um, we really, even even for even though Vermont's pretty progressive, I think I work for a very progressive district. And um, we allow teachers to have the 
we allow teachers to have the um, the ability to sorry <laughs> we allow teachers to have the ability to um, um, you know choose when they need to go somewhere to learn something and um, we allow teachers to have the um, safe space to learn and fail and test things out and we want teachers to try things out just like we want students to not be afraid of trying and testing and trying again and testing and trying again so um, we're really trying to set up that safe environment for teachers to feel like that they can experiment and not get in trouble for it um, challenges that we have is um, in my district, I have administrators really fully on board about OERs and they, they see the power in it and they really want it to be, um, they really want to use that. We're going through a merger right now. Um, so sort of on hold because all of where our documents live right now is going to change to a completely different domain. So we don't want to upload things to OER Commons and then have to re-upload them. So we're waiting for that merger that's gonna happen over the summer and then next year. Um, another challenge is um, most people I talk to around here still have never heard the term open education resources. Um, so it's just like spreading awareness and trying to show educators what's available and that this is here will be sort of our first step. And the way that we've talked about how we're gonna approach this in our district, um, we have to be really careful not to overwhelm because our teachers are really overwhelmed right now already with that law, um, is we have to um, approach it delicately. Um, so how we're gonna do it first is we're gonna upload all of our district resources to OER Commons, and then we're gonna start pointing teachers to those resources on OER Commons instead of in our common Google Drive when they need it. And so the kind of the exposure piece first, we're gonna be running um, professional development on open education resources and how to access them on OER Commons. Um, and then slowly what I'll be doing is I'll be asking teachers for permission to upload their content. So I will start off being the uploader and uploading their content, which I think is really important to not to kind of ease them into that um, and be able to share. Um, for the state, on the state level, I've been really involved in um, trying to figure out how we're all gonna spread awareness at the state level and what are we gonna do. So um, I just finished a graduate program in educational technology and um, got my second master's there. And for my capstone project, I designed a course for the Agency of Education. Um, it's a self-paced, self-enroll um, course where, where educators can learn about, and it's free, can learn about open education resources and how to utilize the platform OER Commons. And we are about to launch that, I hope soon, any day now. Um, and anyone can sign up and take it and and use it it's completely free and then we're going to be designing a second component a more intensive one about open education resources that um, teachers can do for um, graduate credit through a local university um, so I'm, I'm working on that right now it's a little bit um, more broad more of a um, so they take the free course component, but there's more to it as such of like a trainer, train the trainer model. How are they going to bring this back to their communities, you know, their schools and their community? And um, we want them to be able to help drive the movement as well. So we have a lot of exciting things and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens and where we go with this. And um, what else, what else is gonna happen with open education resources? And I'm excited to see as the movement keeps going and teachers, it comes, becomes a more common coin term. It, it's not yet in Vermont, um, but there's some really exciting things happening and a lot of people that have discovered it 
are excited about it. And I've been lucky enough to present this at conferences, local conferences here in Vermont. And it's always, it's always fun to see, um, you know, their reaction when they get into OER Commons and discover like, oh my gosh, I've been looking for this resource and here it is. And um, really realizing the power that there is that I can't believe this is free. I don't have to go buy something. It's already there for me. So that's pretty much um, what I've got, I guess. Great. Well, thank you. Um, it's so exciting to see uh, what's on deck. I know yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a lot um, planned. And I was wondering, you know, that I'm so, I was so impressed with the, how you shared, you know, the, the real culture of experimentation that um, Vermont is, is really trying to support. But I was curious about sharing. I mean, I know that the term OER isn't necessarily a part of people's vocabulary yet, but have you seen, uh, you know, as maybe a, more as your role as a teacher coach, like is, is there a culture of sharing there? Are educators, you know, interested in, in actively sharing what they're using or even what they're creating already? Um, or is that gonna be another kind of shift for, for them as they embark on this OER work? It's a great question. Um, I think there are definitely some teachers that are really excited to share what they have developed and what they're developing. Um, those are usually like, you know, we, we encourage teachers a lot of times to get out of their classroom, to go visit other classrooms, even outside of our district. Um, and they're usually, the, you know, the same, you know, pretty same educators that people want to go see their classrooms because they have been sharing their stuff but it's not a common practice um i think i think we're we're so used to as educators um working in isolation um you're very rarely working in tandem with someone um you may have uh, professional learning groups of your same content or grade level, but you're really in the classroom on your own. Um, and so we're trying to tear down those walls as well. We're really focusing heavily this year on a lot of um, project-based learning um, and trying to do that cross integration of course subject areas and working on the same sort of um, project and it's really cool to see it in action and and again it's another thing that that requires um, a shift in the way that we teach um, so I think I think people are definitely like they're they're curious to see the resources like how do I set up this proficiency based learning classroom like this is completely different than what we grew up as in a classroom it's completely different than the way we were taught how to teach. Um, and we're kind of asking teachers to like, you know, to forget the way that they learned how to teach and this is the new way. And, and it's pretty intimidating and scary. And a lot of people, you know, we have people who just dive right in and, you know, I'll just figure it out as I go. And then the other, you know, there's a lot of people that are, I need to see what this looks like. I need to see what the unit plan looks like for this and how to set up the lesson and things like that. So um, there is some sharing, but everything is sort of being shared. You know, we're Google schools here in Vermont. So everything's living in our private little Google Drive. So there isn't a, you know, we want things to live in a public space where everyone has access to all these great things and there's educators are making some really cool stuff. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, that'll be a culture shift for sure. And that's a hard thing to get people um, to kind of feel comfortable doing because it is, it's your feeling exposed a little bit when people see your work and your lessons and things like that. And I know with all these different initiatives that you all have going that um, with the PBL, you're doing some, some deeper learning um, mm -hmm. work as well. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see any connections with your deeper learning work in OER or have you kind of thought about how um, 
they can be, they can support each other or complement each other as you're rolling out deeper learning uh, content or, or practices while uh, also doing OER and open educational practice? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there are OERs that provide the deeper learning and I think just having a space where you can um, uh, find those resources for deeper learning in one place is is important um, and and just allowing the students the opportunities to to dive deeper to understand better um, to explore and do a lot of that PBL stuff um, I mean there's so many I always go to the NASA thing, but it's so cool and NASA has all those resources on there and can, um, you know, teachers can access that right away and they don't have to go very far to find great stuff. Um, yeah, um, I think finding those integrated lesson plans and, and trying to um, help teachers feel that this, uh, this is obtainable. I think what we're happening, what's happening right now is everybody's really overwhelmed that this is going to be a really difficult shift. Um, and it has been, um, we have different, different schools are at different points. We have some schools that are completely into proficiency based and project based learning. And it's really fun to go in there and see them just all, I mean, uh, there's one elementary school in our district where I, I think every single teacher has tried a project-based learning unit this year. And that is so cool to, to know that they're doing that and that they work together. And it's just like the culture there is very interesting. Um, and they mostly use... Um, they don't use a whole lot of canned curriculum. They, they go outside the box and they, they utilize the resources that fits their needs at that time and the needs of their student. And I think that's, that's what OER is meant to be. It's, you know, you can really um, differentiate and personalize because every class is different. And, you know, one type of curriculum is not going to fit the needs of all students right that's great um so i i want to open this up for for others to either you know unmute yourself and chime in and ask a question or you can use the chat to to share one i mean i have a lot of questions for erica but i want to <laughs> <laughs> i want to um just open it up to to you all too um and the way that you can unmute yourself is um uh, on either next to your name, you can unmute, or um, at the bottom of the screen, you can click on the microphone to un unmute yourself. Um, so I'll give people a chance to to do that. I'm, I'm just looking at the mics, and I don't see anybody unmuting themselves. <laughs> so I'll just keep going. Um, or feel free to add in chat as well. Um, so in terms of next steps, I mean, I know you had shared with me that the the pace has been maybe a little bit slower just given different yeah. kind of barriers and challenges in terms of like all these new initiatives that are rolling out um so i'm just curious like in in an ideal setting like where would you like to be um mm. you know come fall so mm. i know you've done so much work <laughs> around you know your group in OER Commons around creating this course, around, you know, setting up the workflows and plan for, you know, the uploading teacher content to kind of relieve that barrier and, you know, train the trainer. And you've already done all this outreach locally uh, within the state to present and, and share. Uh, come, you know, fall 2018, where, where would you like to be? Um, okay, so fall 2018, I guess. Is that too soon? <laughs> I, yeah, it's kind of soon. I mean, we're almost done here. But I guess, I guess if in the fall, I would love, it, I'm thinking locally in my school district, to just be able to have the opportunity to provide professional development around open education resources. Um, 
and it's something that we've talked about um, and I've talked to the administrators. So our superintendent super on board with open education resources and our curriculum coordinators really gung ho about it because they see how it ties in with all of our initiatives. Um, it's even in our, I believe our continuous improvement plan, which is a plan that all schools have to do in, um, in Vermont. Um, <clears throat> so I would love in the fall to really be starting and hitting the ground <clears throat> running with um, professional development and spreading awareness. So be giving them more, a little bit more of a platform on, um, <clears throat> you know, being able to educate about open education resources and, um, you know, where to find them and how to use them and things like that. Um, and I think I will. We run a very um, different um, type of in-service. Um, this year, we've completely changed the way we do in-service. Um, we don't we don't make everybody in the past years. It was like everybody in one room listening to one same speaker all at the same time, <clears throat> which was um, useless for about 75% of the teachers in that room. Cause we're a pre-K to 12 district. So how, how can you hit everyone with one presenter? <clears throat> so we have, um, we turn it into more of a conference style in, in service and we get in-house presenters. So a lot of our, um, it's mostly run by our faculty and educators. Um, and they, we first figure out what topics do we want to present on? What are, what are teachers asking for? And what do they need? And then we find people who have been doing that to run a, a session, a workshop. And they get to choose where they want to go. So, and then we have about three sessions each time and they choose different sessions throughout the day. Um, so I think that's where I'll be able to kind of get it in. I won't be able to reach everyone, um, but then at locally at the schools, I, I do run like after school professional development, <clears throat> you know, optional, obviously. Um, so I can offer that as well. Um, and start offering teachers the after school time and one on one, more one on one as well. And then also another entry point is um, we have our professional learning communities, which meet once a week. Um, and I can also ask to be put on, you know, the little com the different communities um, schedules to come and talk about what we are. So that's another way. Great. And in terms of your state work, do you see the virtual course that you designed really being the first point of entry for the broader state work or? Yeah, I hope. I think, I think, I think the power though comes and I've seen, I'm hoping that, that what's going to happen is the people who take the course are people who are already um, interested in open education resources and heard of it and are um, looking to spearhead this at their communities um because i think the power with with getting people on board is um the face-to-face -face in house training where i can you can really walk them through and let them discover things as you're walking them through everything um and and i think that's a lot of fun for them to get excited about look what i just found this is so cool um, you know, we are offering this course for professional development um, hours. You have to have so many professional development hours to get relicensure. So we're hoping that's a little hook to get people in as well. <laughs> right. It's free and, you know, you can do it right online whenever you want. It's a self-enroll, self-page. You can take as long as you want, as little as you want. Um, you know, <clears throat> And so do you think there might be something like if people went through that course that they could request like a training, an in-house training or something like that? I, could that be a workflow? I'm hoping. I'm not sure how that would work. Um, yeah. I mean, I've already, I have gone to other schools already that have just seen me at a conference and, and they're local and they're, can you just present at the faculty meeting at this? And that's, that, I love doing that. Um, 
where I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how we do have our ambassador group. So I think that's another thing we need to revive. Um, we had a pretty decent sized group from all over the state and um, we have one, unfortunately the agency of education in Vermont is severely underfunded and there's literally one person in the um, educational technology department. <laughs> He's a department of one. That's wow. how, yeah, you know Peter Drescher, and it's oh yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's he's the only guy in that department. <laughs> um, so he's got a lot on his plate, and um, you know, trying to figure out how to do that is definitely going to be a challenge. Because Vermont, I mean, it's a tiny state, but we're super rural, and you know, from end to end, it's still pretty far. So. You know, it's a challenge. It would be really hard for me to get to the most northern parts of the state to do right. that. So we would have to definitely have a team that's willing to be able to do that. Yeah. And at the same time, like I, I enjoy doing it, so I don't mind. But, you know, there isn't any money that <laughs> the state can provide stipends to. Right. Well, and it might be interesting to see, too. I mean, that's where I thought the the virtual course was so interesting to serve, mm -hmm. you know, such a... Uh, uh, kind of spread out community in very rural parts of the state. Um, and it might be interesting just to see too, like what leaders emerge from, you know, mm -hmm. the virtual course and, you know, these, these different things that, that are happening throughout the state. And maybe that could be a new opportunity to support other teachers with some of these champions or early adopters yeah. that are kind of showing yeah. uh, how this can really help y'all achieve your different, um, goals for all these different initiatives so it's, a, it's, an, it's an exciting time we got to stay tuned to see what's happening yeah, <laughs> Vermont. yeah Vermont, that's for sure <laughs> well um I just want to uh, offer one last opportunity if anybody has any questions I know um thanks Sue for introducing yourself from Lake Washington uh who's been uh, she's helping folks find OER text, doing a lot of things you're doing and learning materials and has even um, developed her own OER course in botany. Oh. Um, so it's neat to see uh, these different uh, folks, you know, trying to do a similar thing as you are and, yeah. uh, and what we're learning along the way. So Sue or um, anyone else, if you have any questions, this is the last call um, uh, for that. Um, but just want to thank everyone so much for attending and uh, we did record this session so we will um, be sharing the recording so if you want to share it with others feel free as well as all the other ones are included and we will actually be I was telling Erica earlier we will be uh, putting this on the OER Commons library uh, we have different uh, webinars showcased on there so that uh, folks can use these because we think these are a great educational resource too for folks to hear from each other um, and learn from each other. So I guess with that, we will um, say thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Erica, so much. I know this is such a busy time and um, it was just so great to learn more about what you're doing. And I think Vermont is just such an interesting uh, use case in terms of, you know, supporting your unique community with with all the different things going on there. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much and can't wait to the, the fun thing is we're going to be, you know, staying connected and working together. So we'll be able to, you know, learn what how how everything goes. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody for attending. And um, please stay in touch. We'll keep you all informed of future webinars and things that we have coming up. Um, but there's always, always fun stuff happening in the OER community. So we'll, we'll keep you all informed. Cool. All right. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Take care. Enjoy your Tuesday. <laughs> Bye. Bye.